Hello and welcome to another episode of AS for Architecture with me, Ambrose Gillick. I'm speaking today with John Leatherland, an urban designer and master planner who, before establishing his own practice, was a founding partner of Farrell's. Urban design is a sister discipline to architecture, so to speak, concerned with the spaces between stuff. This is complex territory for architecture, a practice predominantly orientated towards the production of architectural objects. But it also has to deal with the tension between organic settlement emergence and institutional objectives of control and the application of order from without. You know, the grittiness uh, that, that comes along with people is something that, you know, it's really difficult to legislate for, so it's almost kind of impossible to design it. You, you have to plan to accommodate it. And I think that's the, you know, I, I say that urbanism is, is about planning rather than design. And I, that, I think, is, is a really fundamental difference. Planning it allows for the accidental. A is for architecture, a podcast about architecture, buildings, urban culture and space. Hello and welcome to another episode of Ayers for Architecture. I'm here today with John Leatherland. John, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah. Uh, hi, Ambrose. Yeah, John Leatherland. Uh, I am a uh, an architect by training, uh, but an urbanist by choice, I suppose. Uh, I trained many years ago in, in Manchester and, um, and worked for many years um, under and with and along with uh, Terry Farrell um, mm-hmm. in, in London and I now have my own small practice um, uh, uh, dealing uh, with mostly with uh, uh, mass planning and urbanism and, uh, and I teach along with you at the University of Kent in Canterbury. So how does we do indeed although you at a higher level than me the uh, how does the um I suppose, how is the influence? So Terry Farrell, of course, is postmodern hero. What was your role within that? I mean, you have a close, you had a close working relationship with him. How does, I I quite like to understand Terry Farrell better, I suppose. Well, I think that would be a good thing because I think the guy was uh, um, uh, significant and hugely influential and, you know, one of the best urbanists that this country has produced in many years. I mean, world of a world status, in my in my view. Um, uh, but yeah, and but immediately one's uh, uh, and you're not alone in this. But immediately one's uh, 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 inclination is to think Terry Farrell, oh, postmodernist, uh, and and that's a whole subject of another podcast, I suspect. <laughs> I mean, I don't know whether you want to go there in this one. I mean, I, I think, uh, for, uh, and for many people, uh, postmodernism is a uh, is a, a term of criticism. Mm. Uh, for others, it's a term, uh, it's a, you know, it's a style issue. For Terry, I don't think it ever was a style issue, although we did get into that as, 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 as uh, you know, as a uh, as a sort of visual format, but uh, I think I think it was mostly about postmodern in the broadest postmodernism in the broadest sense. You know that all branches of the arts embraced <laughs> apart from architecture. It, it, it was it was about um, uh, correcting the mistakes of modernism in abandoning all respect and understanding for what had happened before modernism. Mm. Uh, that's what postmodernism is in, or, or, or is in my terms, and was for the practice. Uh, but but the but the focus on on the on you know on its on style and two dimensionality of the thing was um, was a uh, you know was a problem for us. Uh, so your architecture was. So this is something I picked up in the document you sent through on the Kent University Master Plan, which is from two thousand and. What's uh, that? Nineteen. We just, it just, we just finished the master plan uh, uh, before COVID hit, so it was the the end of two thousand and nineteen. And I was reading through that. Um, this beautifully presented document, actually, and very, very rich. And there's a huge amount on context. Mm. And is that? Would you say that that fits with this idea of the the, the postmodern of being of 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 
sort of coming to terms with history as a as an in, well as a as an important factor in architectural and and urban design well without any doubt and and um and i think that we yeah the constituent parts of place or place making are are very broad you know it's mm. the, the places have come about through years and year and generations of layer, layering and evolution and you know and the constituent parts are you know you know, fairly obvious if you if you think about them. You know, I mean, I I would say they begin with geology and geography, topography, landscape, archaeology, history, you know, and so on. The etymology of place names and so on, which doesn't mean that it's all about glancing back, but it is about learning from the past. And you know, how do you how do you know where somewhere's going if you don't know where it's come from? Yeah, I I mean, I often think when we're dealing with architecture. I think of it sometimes a bit like that we walk backwards, that we're, we're constantly pushing for a progressive kind of new way of doing things, but we have our eyes locked firmly on the past and it, and particularly on tot totemic figures, uh, Le Corbusier's and Frank Lloyd Wright's and Altos and people like that. Isn't, <clears throat> isn't dealing with context in that way, in a similar way, sort of slightly fetishistic and peculiar i mean i i know i know that sounds like a rather naughty thing to say because we're meant to care about context but but there seems to me something slightly strange about the overemphasis on i suppose on some of these contextual concerns and uh, now you're just being provocative the the, the, the i would say <laughs> that uh, you, you you can't uh, uh, understand Somewhere, I, I, I think this is probably we, we need to unpack what where architecture and urbanism are, are different okay. in order to have that conversation. Because uh, I think um, I think I think architects. I mean, both both subjects are incredibly complex, and and therefore difficult. You know, it's kind of facile to 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 cover them. You know, without any depth, and and the um, and I and I think for architecture in architecture it's um it's entirely possible to to ignore context and and very often uh and that's done very you know it's done successfully um but i would say for w w in urbanism it's it's the reverse and 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 there are there are many ways in which urbanism and architecture digress uh, and go the separate ways uh and and i think uh you know that the context is is uh, fundamental to urbanism, not mm -hmm. not uh, and not necessarily not necessarily for architecture. Although I, I would I would always advocate that the best architecture is of is 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 of the con of, of of right for its context. Mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, I I in my teaching and, and my work and my teaching, I would I always try and make the point that. Um, everywhere every spot on the face of the planet is unique in some way mm -hmm. you know what the, what the romans would have called the genius loci it's it, you know the, the spirit of the place uh, and and it's it, it, it's our responsibility to discover and, and define that in my mm. in my view and i think uh, uh, if you don't do that you're st starting from the wrong place but there are many examples of really successful architecture that that you know, have just landed there. Mm. You know, they're, they're symbols, uh, you know, they're icons or symbols. And sometimes that has its place. Mm. Uh, normally, <laughs> normally they're, they're at the best when they signify change rather than try and engender change, uh, if you see what I mean. But No, uh, I think that's, that's, a, that's an enormously rich, that's an enormously rich idea. I, I was thinking as you were talking, and, and so you're going to have to explain it a little bit. But I, before you do that, I was thinking as you were talking that for modern, for contemporary architects, the context has increasingly adopted the other architecture around it and the urban form around it. And I did give you, I did see you give that absolutely glorious lecture to the students on ley lines in London and the sort of natural, the natural dynamics that are discernible within the, the production of the urban. 
and we'll get. I, I, I do need to get you to um, explain. I think, for my own benefit, the difference between urban planning or master planning and urban design and 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 architecture. But but the context becomes its own thing in a way, doesn't it? You know, you look at somewhere like St Paul's, which is St Paul's Cathedral in London, which is basically a giant alien spaceship that's landed in the middle of a medieval city, and now it itself is the context which has to be referenced. So there's a kind of inbuilt logic that actually context is not immutable and is fluid and I, and I kind of find that idea kind of more enticing. Perhaps that's more to do with architecture. Uh, blah, blah, blah. The, the, I, you see, I don't see St Paul's quite like that. Uh, St Paul's is is part of a continuum. Uh, that you know that that particular spot in London has been a sacred place for uh, millennia. You know, mm -hmm. since since humans, uh, you know, inhabited that part of the country. I mean, the Romans had their uh, their their temple to uh, the lunar god, I think, there in, in that location. So, uh, and and Ren would have been aware of all that. Uh, and so, there's no accident that that uh, one of our most significant uh, um, sacred spots is, is 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 there. It's not it's a, it's not it hasn't just landed. It's been there. It's there for very good reasons, mm. uh, which are separate to its to its architectural composition. Hmm. But, you know, they do take advantage of all the same, uh, uh, you know, things over the years. Uh, it, it was a, it was a, you look at the contours, it was a piece of high ground. It hmm. could be seen from, from, from uh, uh, pretty much anywhere in, in the city. So, you know, and that's normally what happens with places of worship. They're on, hmm. you know, they're being simplistic about it, but they're usually on, on high ground. So I, I don't think, yeah, you know, you can't have that conversation without separating out architecture and urbanism. You, you know, you okay. You, you then can you appreciate Paul's as a composition independently of anything else, hmm. but 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 you, the deeper meaning is about how it came to be there. You sent me through. You sent me through a good article about about um, the difference by David Rudlin about the difference between architects uh, and urbanists i suppose what is it about architects and urbanism from here and now it was it was in, published in the uh, academy of urbanism journal yeah. just the, last week which i thought was very good but but it talks about this object orientation in architectural education and how this is problematic when you're trying to teach master planning but maybe if you can open out the the inherent differences and, and Rudlin talks in there about the idea of rules within does, yeah. urbanism yeah. and architecture not really being about rules and maybe that's the difference we're encountering well, when you think about St Paul's as a building versus St Paul's as the right function for the space yeah well, uh, yeah I, I thought I think the the rules thing was the bit about the article that I was I would have liked, you know, be interested to talk to him more about. But the, I thought, pretty, pretty much, he, he, he encapsulated the, uh, you know, some really interesting points in a fairly short article. Um, I think that um, one of the, the the difficulties here is, okay, how do you, how do you separate them out? How do you define them? Because they are clearly very la related, architecture and urbanism. But you would, I would say, you know, as he, as Ridling pointed out architecture and architecture schools um, teach architecture as as the design of things objects and um, and and that's that's fine uh, in, in itself but urbanism if you if you you it's almost the other side of the coin is about uh, you know in my in my terms my definition is it's the space between buildings and and one can't exist without the other because unless we have some buildings we're not enclosing space but but um the the planning and design of spaces is 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 what urbanism and master planning is, is all about and it's always a question of scale and, and and size and so on but um the problem is i think that and i i i, I we had lots of conversations uh, about this uh, uh, you know when 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 uh, you know, with with other members of the practice over the years, 
and and the and the, and the basic i think it takes a different mindset that's what i'm getting at i think our architecture is architects are attracted to architecture because it is about the design of objects about the design of the object and spatial thinkers are attracted to other 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 parts of the profession or related professions so an architect will usually be a good architect will usually be very good at designing things uh, buildings furniture cars cutlery so on and so forth and you know some of the best architects do all, all those things uh, extraordinarily well um but um but but uh, a spatial thinker I know you're going to say architecture is about space. There's, there's a spatial composition, but uh, I can I can hear the question uh, uh, taking shape in your mind. But but uh, if you think about the space between buildings, the space between things, mm -hmm. then uh, then you get urbanism, and you get other other professions. You know, you get people who are good. Usually, you get people who are planners, uh, who are also uh, uh, good at urbanism, and interior designers. And uh, and you know uh, uh, and landscape architects are usually good at urbanism uh, in a way that architects struggle with because an architect will always begin with the object and work outwards, whereas mm. an urbanist will start with uh, uh, spatial thinking and work work inwards towards the building. Oh, That's does that make any kind of sense? Yeah, no, it absolutely does. And it, in, in <clears throat> so so the question then is how. So architects start with the object because because then you're starting with something. It's almost like a sculptural act, isn't it? You you sort of and you see and, yeah, and you see that in you know first your design where they where you give them the square meterage of various functions of a building and they sort of cut them out of paper and they organise them and it's immediately an object to to kind of chip away at and and, and mould. But if you're an urbanist and you're dealing with the gaps in between, what are you dealing with at all? At, at the level of a strategic urban design when before there's any buildings there so you know your 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 practice has been in designing i think you've been involved in some of those enormous scaled proposals over in the far east for example mm -hmm. where you're not dealing with anything so yeah. how do you how do you start how do you make a move well uh, I, I think you have to look for what makes what we, we always try to do is look for what makes that place unique and what what's it all about what's its genius loci as, as mm. i said you 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 uh yeah you do have the uh, everyone has a toolkit of, of 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 you know that they turn to uh you know when they're faced with a, a blank piece of paper which mm. can be very scary so you know so you know so architects are taught you know design methodology and urbanists develop their own um uh, kind of methodology and and that's um and that's about all the things I talked about before. You know, for me, it begins. For me personally, I'm most interested in in uh, how the landscape has influenced our places and spaces, mm. uh, because it seems to me that I was talking to a friend the other day, and he was saying, "Yes, it's it's like a game of consequences, uh, uh, place making, but it always begins with the landscape." That's the first question. You know, what's there? I mean, you you know. Very rarely do you build a build a place in a swamp. Mm. It has happened, <laughs> but but uh, like you know, Holland, you, you, yeah, like Holland, uh, <laughs> like, like, like Moscow and, and Leningrad. Uh, uh, you know, but um, but they they were kind of that was that was uh, as you, it, it, that was a that was a very deliberate and self conscious imposition on the landscape rather than. You know, it was it was they were that was planned and designed. Whereas most places exist without any uh, uh, master planning mm. or, or, or or town planning or, or urbanism. Mm. And, and so some of the, the the places that that we quote as, as teachers of urbanism uh, had no, had nothing to do with urban designers. Yeah. Uh, well, I think that's a really that's a really interesting one. So as the profession of urban design has emerged. So, so when I was doing my PhD, I was out in uh, in Gujarat in India in a post disaster situation. Well, not directly. It was it was a few years after the event, and I was looking at some of the reconstruction of that. Um, and 
one of the things there was a beautiful medieval city called Buj, B H U J, in in an area of Gujarat called Kutch, just below the Sindh Valley, just below the Pakistan border. Uh, and by just, I mean Indian scale just. I mean it's not really just. Um, it's a long way, but. Um, and they sort of planned it in in the post disaster situation. They had to replan it for 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 safety and security, and and because a lot of buildings had fallen down. And this medieval city, which had organically grown, all of a sudden became a sort of planned space, which is to say, a, an ostensibly modernist space. And I wonder how urban planning deals with that tension, that the the natural organic processes of urban growth are, are, are not replicable by any top-down process. So how do, and, and, and that, I, for me, that constitutes a problem in terms of the enabling of alternative lifestyles, essentially, like how, how you know, if, 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 if when you go into urban plan, you are always imposing an essentially modernist notion of space and time, how do we do urban design and maintain diversity of urban identity, social identity? Is that possible? Yeah, I, 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 yeah it's hard work. I, that's what I say. It's, you know, it's not to be diminished uh, as a topic because it's incredibly complicated but there are I think there are some basic uh, rules and Rudland kind of you know I thought very eloquently described them in, in his heart in his article it's about you know uh, space we're a we're a we're a, a very um, uh, social and interdependent species mm -hmm. the urban human and yeah. uh, and and so there are there are some essentials, you know, interconnectedness of of spaces, uh, and and meeting spaces and so on. You've got the you've you've kind of got to let the accidental happen. Mm. I remember, uh, you know, <laughs> when they built uh, Brasilia, you know, that was a kind of you know super modern kind of twentieth century kind of city, uh, uh, you know, designed on 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 the on the drawing board and built you know uh, 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 imposed on the landscape and the first thing that happens you know you start to get kind of uh, red light districts as soon as humans start to inhabit it they mm. do the things that humans do they mm. start to kind of uh, you know leave trash everywhere and 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 uh, and and uh, you know the grittiness uh, that that comes along with um, mm. with 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 people mm. is something that um you know, it's really difficult to legislate for, but it, it's, so so it's almost kind of impossible to design it. Mm. You, you have to plan to accommodate it. Mm. And I think that's the, you know, I, I say that uh, 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 urbanism is, is about planning rather than design. And I, mm. that I think is, is a really fundamental difference. Uh, planning it allows for the accidental. So, what, so it's a more of an abstract process. So you start off with this very abstract concept of the of the genius loci of the of the spirit of the place, yeah. And you work at a scale that is detached from the context. Is that is that something that, if you're going to if you're going to enable the accidental, the organic, do you have to keep at a remove from from this process, from from the kind of reality of what you is it is it like like you see Le Corbusier's plans for places like Addis Ababa, which are psychotic, or, or Chandigarh, which are psychotic and built. Um, and it's extremely abstract as a thing, like decontextual on another level. Is yeah. that gone? Well, I was going to say, I think the problem with, with trying to provide an answer is that because it's because you're trying to imagine it, uh, uh, urbanism as a design process. Mm. I think the I think the I think the flaw is in in the question with the, the, the greatest of respect, Ambrose. I, th I think you have to uh, stop stop thinking about it as a design process. Okay. And, I'm, I'm, and unfortunately, I think that's how it's taught in architecture schools because architecture schools are about teaching design, mm. and uh, and actually, planning is something that comes before that pro that, that design process. So it's more of it, it, it's a, it's a good deal more 
about uh, understanding the uh, and uh, the the what that place is about three dimensionally, and uh, and 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 what are the rules that the landscape are imposing upon how set a pattern of settlement might come about there, and uh, and allowing that to be to infuse completely how how a um, one starts to think of you know a. a, a, a a city emerging, or a, a, a village, or a town, or mm -hmm. a, a whatever size place emerging. It's a kind of different process. It, mm -hmm. you, you're using a completely different part of your brain. It's right brain, left brain stuff, and and uh, and I think it's and that's why I think very few people are good at architecture and urbanism. Mm. You're usually good at one or the other because mm. you know you, you, our brains are not that that you know not big enough to be able to cope with both you you, mm. you know you we have one you know an, an emphasis on the uh linear and, and scientific or, mm. or the um or the spatial and uh and, and artistic i i think i think it's like it's the difference between linear thinking and lateral thinking mm. it's very difficult to do both i mean you know you as soon as you meet someone you can normally tell which they are can't you yeah yeah if that's one really starts, a, that's... one starts ordering you about and the other one you know starts offering you a beer <laughs> is the urbanist the nice one yeah of course <laughs> <laughs> i would i would definitely agree with you uh, i think there's i think this is a really interesting idea i mean for me the issue with urban design is simply scale is that i find it you know you get trained in architecture school to move up through the scales from it depends which school you're at, but from sort of hand sized object, body sized objects to by the end of your third year or fifth year designing some kilometer long thing. But you're never actually dealing in a, or very rarely are you actually dealing with a, a connected or an interconnected urban reality. So so last year we did a project, no, year before last, we did a project in the third year in, in Margate. And I wanted the students to think about Margate as ostensibly a kind of satellite of London. Not because it is, but because I thought it was a useful design, device to kind of charge their designs, to think about what their designs are trying to achieve in terms of the footfall and people that they were designing for. And it didn't, I don't think it, it, it featured in any single project. They They at best got down from sort of, uh, about I would say about quarter of a mile was about as far as they could get and they were still designing objects in that space and the space between was was kind of limited by that yeah I, I it didn't surprise me and, and um I mean that that that's a whole interesting subject in its own right I, I how do you get how do you teach it uh uh, uh you know productively and uh, I, I I presume you're talking about uh, undergrad students, yeah, uh, uh, who are much better at and more interested in urbanism, uh, but they've already had the best part of two or more years being taught to design objects mm. by then, haven't they? So you're not getting them in a in a raw state, and you're also teaching people who've gone to schools of architecture because they have an inclination towards wanting to design objects. Mm. So you kind of there, you know, the raw material is 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 a is a difficult thing to begin with. You know, it's you're not it's not you're not dealing with uh, you know um, unformed clay here. It's mm. already got a shape. And, and uh, as you know, I, I uh, for the last few years I've been teaching urbanism to um, uh, postgraduates, uh, uh, master students, and they are. Uh, they're much worse because by then they've had five years of thinking yeah. about objects. And actually, it's like try, tr trying to teach them urbanism is like trying to turn an oil tanker mm. because they, it's, it's absolutely not only is it their, is it their inclination, it's their, it's their whole training. Mm. Uh, I'm not sure that scale, it's kind of interesting that question of scale. That's why I, I react. I'm just go, going back to the question a, 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 a bit more. Scale is, um, I'm not sure scale is like the biggest issue for urbanism in, 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 in planning, in urban planning. I don't think it is because, uh, you know, I'm never worried 
what scale the students work at. And I can't tell them that mm. because um, you, uh, who knows, you might, you might be designing, you know, a small, a small settlement, you might be designing a city. It doesn't really matter what scale you're working at, uh, providing that you've got the, you, you've got the starting point right. Uh, and you, and you understand essentially what the place is telling you it wants to be. That's the thing you have to discover, uh, which I think is a is a is a sort of misquote of Louis Kahn, but but it is uh, it, it is it, it is the the thing. What's you have to look for what the place is telling you it wants to be, and don't and and don't uh, try and impose something unnaturally on it. And therefore, it doesn't matter what scale you're working at because. Uh, I mean, you do have to know how big things are. You know, how big is a house? You know, units of units of of of, of uh, that, you know. You have to start with something because you know, you know, it's going to be quite likely it might be built. You have, you know, there's a danger whatever you plan might be built. But um, you know, uh, as, as you know, during COVID, most of the most of the presentations we see the students giving um, are. You know, in in um, you know our, our slideshows, mm. and uh, so we've no idea what scale we've been drawing at. It might write a scale on the bottom of the drawing, but it's meaningless, isn't it? Yeah. You know, when you see it projected, how big is the screen? Yeah. It's meaningless. It doesn't matter what's it, but and and uh, you know, I can't, as you, I, we're both teaching on the same module at the moment, and 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 it's all it's. The scale that the students have to work at is all pre prescribed for them. Mm. Why? You know, it's irrelevant. At the, you know, in, in urban planning, that's kind of irrelevant mm. at the beginning. It's much more important to understand the place mm. and what it's telling you it's, it, it wants to be. Well, I like this idea. I like this idea of, I mean, I've always been inspired. This is a Christian Norberg Schultz idea, isn't it? The, uh, the idea of genius loci or the, the reuse of it in, in, in architectural language. And, and and all through those kind of phenomenologists and and uh, what are they critical regionalists? Isn't that what Kenneth Frampton calls them? The critical regionalists, people like Ertzen and Asplund. And, but I but I, I did wonder about this idea of so you've used this word placemaking, and in the mm. document in the master plan document for Kent University, I think it features something like over twenty five times, and and you. And, and it is a word that is used a lot, and I'm not sure I understand what it means. And uh, I said, I was uh, on another episode of this, I was talking to a, a, an architect who's trained um, as a town planner as well, and, and she used it. And I said, you know, what does that mean? Don't places already exist? I mean, isn't placemaking something essentially a gentrifying word? Isn't placemaking a way of saying you can get a flat white and a toasted panini or a baba ganoush, a ganoush or something like that is, is is that what placemaking is yeah next question <laughs> now uh well <laughs> go on you've got you've got to tell me what it is it's a mystery <laughs> but yeah and, and it, it, it's a burden yeah, because it's difficult to de but it's a difficult to describe what we're on about in in, in other ways uh placemaking i a place is about um you know, it's the collision of all those things that we need as as an interconnected, interdependent humans. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's that's what it means. So you are providing a setting for those those things to happen. You know, a, a sort of urban theatre mm -hmm. for those things to happen, but not always. There, you know, that uh, you've got you've got to also anticipate the ordinary. I think one of the Oh, I, I sound like I hate architects. I don't at all. I, I think they're lovely people, and I and I and I and I, and I, 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 I think they're an incredibly uh, um, uh, uh, useful people. But uh, I think in our, with architects, they're always taught to be the best. You know, you're taught to be competitive from day one at, at school in schools of architecture. Yeah. Whereas it, I always, I, I, I always try to teach my students. That actually collaboration uh, is 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 a much better place to begin. Mm. So, um, so it's about all those things, and uh, I think that urbanism. I think uh, you know. I, I think architecture. The problem is architecture. We, we I'm even using placement. 
placemaking is, is equally as bad as using the expression schools of architecture, because there's no good reason why everything has to be about, about architecture. Mm. I think that, you know, I would say that you could eat, you could very well, you very usefully rename uh, those places as schools of place or schools of placemaking. Mm. And within them teach architecture, urbanism, interior, uh, interiors, spatial planning, mm. uh, town planning, landscape, and so on. Um, so, uh, so it's because they're all absolutely essential in the in the uh, composition of our uh, 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 urbanity, our uh, the places that we inhabit as an urban species. So uh, it's um, it's a it's a it's a hopeless placemaking is a hopelessly inadequate expression, but but it but it, and it that tries to encompass. A, ma a mass, a massive uh, amount of very complex um, uh, um, uh, uh, necessary information, but we all know it intrinsically. That's the thing. We, we, we're all uh, urbanists. Um, we're all postmodernists, and we're all urbanists. Really, uh, it's just that we're uh, many of us are in denial about it. You know, let's, for example, and I, and I say this to my students, we're, we all understand good urbanism because that's where we go on holiday. You know, mm. if, we, if we go on a city break, we'd, we'd, we're making a positive choice about where we want to go. You mm. know, we don't go anywhere that isn't hugely valuable. We very we, we may do if we're masochists, but generally speaking, we, we go... We, we choose places because they're quite wonderful for all kinds of reasons. Yeah. So we, we do, everyone understands urbanism and, fa and is fascinated by it. You know, the, the joy of wandering around the, the city that you don't know and then finding your way back to the hotel again, mm. it, you know, it's such a great, you know, it's great, you know, learning, get, developing a mental map of a place is just yeah. utterly fascinating, isn't it? It and is. That's, that's urbanism. I, I mean, it's that that's a really, uh, it, there's, there's some, I'm trying to think, Pla placemaking seems therefore to me to relate in some way, as you say, it's a oh, post, it's yeah. a post, m m go on. I didn't finish answering the question, did I? Well, uh, yes, I think places do exist. You're absolutely right. And, uh, you know, as I've just described, and, and we go there through, through, through choice. And I think if you're working within an existing place, uh, you know, then you have to learn to understand that and, and, and respect it and work with it. Like a carpenter would work uh, with the grain of a piece of wood. You mm. never get you never get a good carpenter trying to plane a piece of wood across the grain. No. Uh, uh, and and in the same way, a a good urbanist will work will learn and read the the grain of a place and work with it. Mm. Uh, it's different, of course, when you when you're trying to impose a, a, a new settlement on uh, raw virgin landscape that's different mm. so 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 creating something self-consciously creating uh, a, a new urban environment on on a, on a, on, a, on, a, on a an unbuilt on landscape is a quite different thing but I mean essentially the same but but that's that's when it becomes uh, all the more, all the more difficult, yeah, like crazy difficult. But but uh, how you know you can't do that without understanding what that landscape's telling you it wants to be. Yeah. Um, and I think you know that's an intrinsic skill we have. I, I just think we kind of turn it off. We mm. turned it off a long time ago. Yeah, uh, but we all you know you know like you know, cities constantly transform london's a great example of a city that carries on reinventing itself it's bruised and battered and you know and and abused and abused but it keeps on turning out to be the most wonderful place because it it's you know it because of its original urban composition it mm. works because it was a collection of small uh, villages uh, and hamlets and and towns that coalesced completely mm. at odds with the way that we're taught. We teach our students how cities come about. Mm. London is it breaks all the rules, mm. but as a result of that, it's lots. It's an, an, an it's a uh, 
a conglomeration of places, mm. all with you know all with independent uh, characters and personalities. And as a result, as one as one diminishes in, in significance for whatever reason, uh, an, another one is emerging. Yeah, and then and and and, uh, and it keeps on re- regenerating through through that process, and uh, trying to capture that as a as a piece of planning for a new place is absolutely you know difficult but um, um, amazingly uh, interesting. Yes, I spent a lot. Uh, I spent a quite a bit of time looking at the London Docklands in the nineteen eighties and the replanning of, or the, the total absence of replanning in the in the <laughs> redevelopment of that, and I, I found that quite because that was. In my reading of it, that was a fundamentally, I would say, the zenith of postmodern planning insofar as it kind of stuck down these buildings and allowed the gaps to kind of, uh, the gaps to have tension within them and then to see what ha- would happen in those spaces. And, and largely, uh, despite all the predictions, it actually seems quite successful um, in a peculiar kind of, and, and not particularly pretty way. But I wanted to come back to your you mentioned this idea of the ordinary, and in this in this description of placemaking, you you seem to me to describe a modernist housing estate state as the problem, and what placemaking is doing is trying to reconnect. You know, you look at the peripheral housing estates. So I was up in Glasgow. You look at the peripheral housing estates in places like Easter House or Drum Chapel. And they lacked amenity on an epic level, very big settlements with very little amenity to them. Um, and, and a sort of decontextual architecture and a, and a, a car centric, really a car centric mm-hmm. transport infrastructure. And I suppose what placemaking is trying to do is trying to add in a bit of the ordinary, a bit of the everyday, the way, you know, the, the fabric that will make ordinary processes of everyday life possible is that right is that is is placemaking sort of it's not anti-georgian townhouse and it's not anti-victorian you know working class terraces and it doesn't seem to be anti-medieval city centers it does seem to be very much orientated against the kind of barrenness of of that post-war modernity yeah, yeah, uh, it, it, which which comes about because um, you know we we just broke all the rules for for the the, the way uh, cities are composed, didn't we? In that mm. in that era, I mean, deli- quite deliberately, you know, history was 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 consigned to the rubbish bin. Uh, mm. It was it was a, the past was a bad thing, and you can understand how that came about because you know, for many people, you know, their their, their lives and um, and their where they lived, you know, was was very. Uh, was very miserable and, and poor and so on and you know and you know you're you're obviously living in a garret that's you know uh, you know and in, in, in miserable poverty uh, and, and so you know uh, you know the first thing you will want to do is knock down your house and build a tower block to live in I can understand that but um, but the, the 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 problem is that um, you know uh, I, I mean it came from uh, a variety of sources that include i mean you 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 referenced the Corbusier, for example and yeah, and uh, uh you know and, and and guys like that were you were writing sort of theories and textbooks about uh the the modern city uh, um and and but coming at it from the point of view of architects who who like to design objects so you know you you, you see uh, you know um, any number of uh, of post-war housing developments um, with 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 the buildings located as objects in space, mm. you know, with with what used to be called contiguous space around them, which which was a kind of you know a post rational kind of justification for the fact that they couldn't th- think of how to describe it otherwise. Because uh, it certainly wasn't, uh, you know, streets and spaces and squares and mm-hmm. and places. It was, you know, it was a a new a new kind of space, mm. which um, which you know which which has clearly not worked. Um, and 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 I think you know in that's that's why I'm saying postmodernism recognised the fact that we'd lost an awful lot along the way. 
in in, think, in, in beginning to think like that and uh, and and imposing this kind of new regime in a you know in a very top, as you say in a very top down way mm. whereas bottom up thinking would you know you'd start to you know is is, is a cooperative process mm. you know uh, a street comes about because it's it's the route between one but somewhere and somewhere else mm. and at certain points along that route uh, it becomes useful to to a, a, a group of people to um, uh, to to occupy it and 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 so cooperatively they built buildings they built their buildings uh, that help to define that uh, that you know that street mm. um, and uh, and enclose it a space and maybe they they they, they then started if they needed a marketplace then they widened it out and made a square or mm. or some kind of uh, uh, place and it was done unself consciously and 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 and, and uh, and, and cooperatively, uh, <laughs> and postmodern planning, uh, post-war planning didn't do that. It, it was it was it was absolutely an imposition of a new kind of zealous ideal, mm. uh, which, which um, it, you know, in, into our into our long-established cities, that made no sense. Where did it come from? Mm. You know, Aber- Abercrombie was just about. Um, you know the, the the most appalling urbanist that you know that, that ever. Uh, uh, where did he get his ideas? I mean, it was so utterly insane. You know, driving kind of six lane motorways through Primrose Hill. I mean, it, I mean, it. it, it I, I think you know there was a there was a particular period of utter craziness, mm. um, which. which <clears throat> Thankfully, we seem to be uh, uh, have overcome. Uh, have overcome. You know, uh, you know. From people like him came this notion that our cities had to be zoned. You couldn't. You know, he was appalled that people in Shoreditch were living uh, so close to the fact there the factories and places of work. Mm. You know, you know, in unhealthy conditions and so on, which I'm sure was true. I'm sure the you know the but it, it wasn't the. It wasn't the city that was the fault. It was the factories belching out pollution mm. that made that unpleasant. Uh, thankfully, in the postmodern era, post-industrial era, where we, you know, we, we've overcome those kind of problems. But um, but we've we soon discovered that zoning and and putting you know housing here and uh, hospitals here and schools here and uh, workplace here. You know, is a is a, is a is a very unnatural way to compose our our our, our urban settlements, mm. and um, and and uh, you know, post-war residential planning is just a facet of that uh, inappropriate. Uh, I think. Uh, I think. For me, I think it's actually a, a component of colonial thinking. I've thought about Abercrombie and I thought about Robert Bruce up in Glasgow as well, and they both produced plans for Glasgow. And um, they were equally wild. I mean, Robert Bruce's plan was to level the whole of Glasgow, the whole of it. Um, And they came up with a sort of halfway house between Abercrombie and Bruce's. But I think, I honestly think that there was, that it was the same attitude which saw the whole world as the, uh, as a space for the carve up of, by, by, by people who could against people who couldn't really, and and I think that's the British Empire. Yeah, it's definitely a class thing. I, I I agree with that, but but I think um, you know it was it was it was um, it was well meaning. Uh, I think in many respects, but but utterly misplaced. I mean, the fact that you know the the Abercrombie's take on London was, you know, we were all going to be we would all own cars and we would all be driving everywhere and so on was you know was just uh uh was the root, root cause of much of, of much of uh you know his road planning transport planning mm. and, and that's left us with well the interesting thing is it's created a lot of work for modern day urban planners and i'm not going to knock it <laughs> it's also created it some really, really interesting <laughs> it's created some really interesting little squiffy spaces under the motorways. I, I, I remember late one night, uh, you know, three sheets to the wind, finding myself in a 
in a bar in under the Westway. No idea where it was, but it was, a, you know, it was literally built underneath yeah. the motorway. It was yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, uh, oh, great know, fun. Yeah. And that's Brasilia. That's what, yeah. I'm, that's what I'm talking about. Uh, you know, you humans will uh, adapt and convert mm. uh, despite what, what, what you give them. And um, mm. Yeah, he did. Uh, Abercrombie didn't destroy London. He made a mess of, you know, good chunks of it. But, uh, but, 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 you know, it's a, it's now we understand that, that kind of thing is not, you know, it's it, humans take over again eventually. Mm. Yeah, you're right. I like, I, I, you, you, yeah, the, the whole kind of class structure colonial thing is, is a is an interesting take on it. Yeah. No, I, I've I've. I, first time I encountered them, I was like, oh, right, this is just colonialism, right? It's like they'd lost the colonies, so they needed to go and that, all that energy they spent telling, you know, indigenous people in other parts of the world what to do, they just came home and they started doing it to... Except, of course, we just had loads of them because we had this giant empire and they all came home and then just, like, made a mess of everything. Anyway, that's another topic for another day. I... You've talked a bit about town planning, and I would quite like, so the relationship of urbanism to town planning, which comes first? Does, I mean, obviously town planning, they work through these very kind of long-term socioeconomic kind of models. Where does the urbanist get brought in? Say, say, say for example, in Ebbsfleet, how does a process like Ebbsfleet unfold? You get a government policy, which is to create a new commuter town and then do they bring in designers or is it immediately into i don't know uh, well i i think uh I, I, in my in my thinking town planning is a is is a um a, a, a study of uh land and resources and and economics and how and how we make decisions on a and, and politics on a big scale mm. um, uh, and um but does the urbanist sit does the urbanist sit alongside them at that point and guide their thinking because obviously obviously there's a correlation between the two you know if you're going to make successful economic sustainable spaces yeah. you need the designer to sit with the planner so that they don't put the industry in the place that's wrong for it and the housing in the place that's not good. You know, have you found in your practice that you've been incorporated at an early stage in these processes? Well, in th I suppose in theory, that's how it should work. Mm. In reality, um, it never works like that. And, um, and uh, you know, the, the public sector very rarely has um has a huge influence on uh our, on on developing our environment mm. uh, very rarely uh, and the private the private sector pretty much has all uh, has all the influence uh because they own the land mm. uh, and um and and you know and rarely and ebbs fleet is one of the, the rare examples of how uh a, a piece of territory uh uh, uh, post-industrial territory has uh, has has become uh, the focus of it, of, of attention, um, but I think you can't see Ebb's fleet in uh, you know outside the context of the regeneration of the much much bigger region, and uh, and we we got involved in that at Farrell's uh, in a big way where, with a in the in the Thames Gateway initiative, mm. and. Um, and it was interesting that, uh, um, and I think that, I, yeah, I, I suppose drilling down a bit into what what what's the difference, that what was interesting, what it began to interest us, was that they were talking about this thing as being uh, like the biggest regeneration uh, um, area, an opportunity in in Europe, you know, on a regeneration on a ma uh, on a massive scale, and. Um, um, but but when it was but, but there were no pictures, there, no one was drawing anything, and um, 
and and whenever it was, another article was published in in the press about it in the media, uh, you know, they would just show photographs of this hor- horrendous sort of uh, uh, post Holocaust kind of uh, uh, landscape, you know, with with the odd sort of uh, housing development, you know, within a in a landscape of uh, um, um, you know, power lines and things, you know, just the most appalling place, you know, as, as, as I remember Terry saying, you know, why would anyone want to go and live there? You know, yeah. and, um, so, and, it, and it stimulated a, a, us to undertake a, as a, on a kind of pro bono basis an exercise to, OK, well, what, 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 would, what might it look like? Mm. And I think that, and I think it did require and, and actually, it was all done for free, and uh, it was a you know quite a lot of work uh, that we you know we did in our spare time. But but uh, what it did was it kind of put a picture on the on the on the on the box on the of the jigsaw, and um, and uh, and I think without that, I think I think that strategic uh, sort of economists and and town planners can do so much. And that, you know, because that's very complex in its own right, economics and politics and so on and so forth. But actually, unless you're able to draw something, mm. then it doesn't come to life. And, mm. and, and, and we said, well, uh, this is not about uh, uh, it, this is not about um, uh, urban planning, really. It's about landscape. It's about regenerating the landscape. And, and regenerating the communities that are already there. It's already lived in, it's already inhabited, wow. it's got a great story. There's a huge narrative to, be, be, to the Thames Gateway. And when we began to draw it, we breathed some life into it. And as a result of doing all that, we were then commissioned by the government to produce the report that we'd already done. And, uh, and they threw a few grouts at us for you know, for, for for writing a, a kind of strategy document, yeah. but uh, but, but um, so I think you have to draw. I think you have to be able to uh, imagine. You have to have imagination and the ability to make uh, make pictures out of that to to yeah. in order to fire people's imaginations. Uh, so I think that's what that's where an urban planner would. Uh, but would be most effect- is most effective in those situations. Yeah, and that that's that's what they can bring. Yeah, amazing. Does that, does yeah, it does. Question? It does answer my question. So I've got one more question, and we've touched on it a couple of times. But this is this idea of how do we teach this thing? So you and I are struggling away at the moment trying to teach a thing, hmm. dealing with about a kilometre and a half stretch of Kent coastline which goes from, which is never barren. It's always kind of, there, there's, there's a lot there. But how do we teach young architects, if not to be urban designers, then at least be to, to design architecturally in relation to urban concerns, urban design concerns? Well, well I think you have to give it, I think you have to give urban planning uh, prominence from day one, uh, and, and maybe you have to unpick the way the way uh, architecture is taught. But I think uh, 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 to begin with, to be pragmatic, you've actually got to t- start to teach urbanism to architects. You know, kind of from from the start. Mm-hmm. And and uh, I, I don't know, Ambrose, you may know better than I, but uh, but the the project that we're teaching at the moment is that the first. Is that their first encounter with urbanism? Well, so obviously before we started recording this, you told the story, told the story of one building is architecture, two buildings is urbanism. I think they've done, yeah, I, I think they've done that, urbanism. I what? I wasn't saying I believe that. Uh, no, no, I'm no. That's an architect's view of what urbanism is. Okay, well... By an architect's view, they've done urbanism, but I don't think in a real way that they've done urbanism. No, no. So, and I think that that would be that would be val- really valuable. I'd really love to persuade the, our school of architecture and and all the schools of architecture to teach urbanism, uh, urban planning from day one, and mm. to, and to explain and differentiate uh, uh, between the the disciplines. The problem is that most architects come. 
optics have a problem of, of thinking they can do everything. Mm. Uh, and, and they're kind of encouraged to think like that as well, because it is such an incredibly complex subject. You know, we're, we are, you know, we're, you know, even in the brief we're teaching, we're supposed to be able to, uh, uh, we're supposed, you know, in, in the planning of the, of the place we're talking about, we're supposed to decide what uses go in the building. How do we know that? Oh, we spe- we're not economists. We don't. We have no idea. So you have to kind of learn w- to understand what you don't know and why you don't know it and who to turn to when, you, when you're in that situation. Mm. And, uh, and, and that's what cooperation and collaboration is all about. So um, I, I don't expect that we would, that every single uh, uh, architecture student coming into a school of architecture would f- suddenly get fantastically interested in, in urban uh, urbanism but if they understood it then they'd know when they needed it yeah and if they didn't want to do it themselves that they would turn to someone who's um you know who's better at it than them mm. um and um and i think that so i think that's one thing i mean this is the biggest question you've asked at all so how long have we got well, we've probably already overrun um but, but just looking at the project that we're, that we're teaching is probably a good example. So first of all, is understanding what urbanism is all about. Trying to get the students to understand what uh, what what the spirit of the place is 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 about would 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 be helpful, and giving them sufficient time to do that uh, in a project because mm. because <laughs> we're teaching. Don't forget. And I'm not I'm not criticizing the, the module at all. I mean, I'm sure everyone's doing the best, but we're teaching a, a, on a on a, a, a project which is ostensibly about urban planning. But the end result is the, the students have to produce sections through the wall of a building at one to twenty and one to five. You know what? So it's actually it's an architecture. Uh, uh, module mm-hmm. with a bit of bit more site analysis at the beginning, really. Yeah, with a longer lead-in. <laughs> so you know that that's uh, that to me is a bit daft. But also um, the other thing I would I would say is the the uh, specialisms are the are the are the enemy of good urbanism, and I think architecture has become a two uh, or the or the, the development building development not architecture building development has become too specialized mm. uh, you know so now we have to design uh, you know we took architecture students are taught to design uh some housing or a museum or a school uh or a clinic or a university or a or something it's always you know there's a there's a there's a main main heading isn't there to mm. everything Instead of uh, what I believe to be a much more sustainable way of thinking is try to, to design buildings that can accommodate change. Mm-hmm. And for me, a good master plan is always one that can accept and accommodate change mm. uh, and that we shouldn't be worrying about what goes in the building uh, so much as enabling the right kind of things to go into those buildings, but that over time they'll adapt. Mm. to you know human nature and hu- the influence of how human beings uh, behave and how that changes and continues to change almost at a, an exponential rate yeah. so uh you know it's one of the things i, I talked about in the, in the in the university master plan that you referred to earlier is that you know the university is doing it all the time they build a building which is a library or a science department or or a chapel or a or you know or a school of architecture or something and actually once that function has uh, become defunct for whatever reason then the building has to be torn down and, and we start again mm. and i don't know what the what the life of buildings is now i don't i have no idea you know when when i was at architecture school you know we were told that buildings have to last at least 100 years i don't think that's the case now is it <laughs> when you look at them, it doesn't like they're going to no i don't i don't think that I, it's a bigger but more political conversation i think architecture is so deeply wedded into um sort of uh development uh as an economic thing 
that we're not really called upon to make sustainability central to our practice. What uh, what we do, I think, increasingly is sort of add matter to speculative land values. I yeah. think that's kind of what we do. We we provide occupation as land values escalate, and that and and. And I think build, building technology and building materials are cheap as a consequence of that. You, you, so yeah. you, so you. I mean, there's some very famous architects whose names shall go uh, unmentioned, just in case I libel them. But I think that their buildings are essentially spec buildings, but with a bit of whizzy shape to them. Um, and they're as cheap as chips. And it's quite clear they're as yeah. cheap as chips. And they're going to be knocked down in fifty years. Well, probably they're, less. Well, the, no, they'll be they'll 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 need to be knocked down in twenty five. And then they'll yeah. then they'll languish and limp on for another generation before someone finally puts them out of their misery, and then something so, uh, bigger will be built on it. Yeah, yeah, well, 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 well possibly true, but uh, you know, uh, many of our cities survive on buildings that were built, you know, a hundred or one hundred and fifty years ago. Now, and I, I know it sounds like I'm harking back to the past again, but you know, so a lot of the industrial buildings that were built, mm -hmm. you know, you, you know, during the industrial era, uh, you know, still uh, those, those that survived the uh, the wrecking ball after the war are still uh, in, in 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 you know in use. So it's where most architects open their offices, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, uh, but but. There's no good reason why modern buildings can't be multifunctional. You know, we're we're very good at creating space now. Uh, so why can't why you know buildings should be much more adaptable in my view, and I think we should teach that. You know, and I don't know where that sits in terms of is that good urbanism or good architecture. It's probably somewhere equally high in, in uh, you know in both in both in both categories. But uh, those kind of things, I think we need to think more more. Those kind of things are how we think more sustainably. Mm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, that that you know that 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 funny old word that we keep using, but um, you know the it, it, the inbuilt obsolescence of most buildings is a problem. I think mm. we should be addressing, and I think if all architects were trained to think like that, then they would have more interesting conversations with the people with the developers that employ them. And and without wishing to do a hopeless segue, I think if the urban design was good, so you go to Shoreditch, where all the architects are, and that area has been dominated by creative enterprises for a very long time, from the Forever, Huguenots, yeah. Uh, yeah, through, yeah, all the way through. And so architects find themselves in buildings which were designed for creative functions, even if they were in light industrial functions, they were creative functions. And so it seems, as you say, to go back to this idea of genius loci, it seems that that is the kind of spirit of the place. And the urbanism, and I used to hang out there a lot, really precipitates that. It's this kind of amazing melting pot of opportunity to meet and mingle with the kind of people like yourself, like um, architects and planners and urban designers and, and, and makers and thinkers and doers and creative people. And it's amazing for it. It really does it beautifully. Great fun. Yeah, and it's not lacking traffic. It's not like it's quiet and peaceful and twee, no. you know, no. rigid with traffic. And oh, it's true, and not designed, not designed, not planned, not planned for. And and that's the kind of thing you have to. I mean, I'm not saying every everywhere needs to be like Shoreditch, be appalling if it was, but uh, you know, the accidental mm. that uh, that that's created that. Um, all the accidents that created that place are, are th you know, is what we have to learn from. Yeah, yeah. The urban the urban form enables the interior form of buildings. I think that's right. And and if the urban form is good and embedded and contextual and relevant and related and human and ordinary and everyday and all of these beautiful th you've, things that you've kind of talked about, I think for me the buildings will themselves end up flexible. I think one of the yeah I think one of the the reasons why building building functions are inflexible is because the urban context in which they are set is hopeless and kind of you don't want to go outside so well possibly possibly yeah uh, uh, yeah I, I I don't know I think it's got a lot more to do with uh, uh, economics you know and 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 funding 
in, in, in investments and funding, which is where the, where specialization comes from. Mm. Uh, you know, if you if if you want to build a hotel, uh, you go to a particular type of investor. If you mm. want to go, if you want to build an office, you go to a different kind of investor, and they're all they're all in their own silos. Mm. And uh, and and uh, you know, it's very rare that you get very rare that you get mixed use building. Mm. You get mixed use areas, and that's how we compensate. But you very rarely get mixed use buildings, and uh, and yet and yet we you know we try and teach that in architecture schools, don't we? You get a you get a real uh, uh, rude awakening when you get out in the real world. Mm. When you start talking about mixed use buildings, they don't exist. They just don't exist, do they? Yeah, you, know, you might get you might get a building that has a shop at the ground floor and apartments mm. above it. But if you look around most shopping streets and you look above the uh, above the shop fascia, you'll see that the building above is largely unoccupied normally. You know, yeah. but it's kind of storerooms for the for the for the shops. For some reason, we d- we don't like to live above. Uh, uh, we don't, you know, we don't like to occupy mixed-use buildings. It's strange, mm. weird. It's really mm. weird. Uh, I mean, that's a particular British kind of uh, foible. I think that's that's not that's not true necessarily outside these shores, but it is true in Britain. And there are all kinds of things that we should be, you know, there are. There's common. I suppose what I'm saying is to wrap, bring it back to your original question three hours ago what, what what we're what we need to do is you know there's common ground in architecture and urbanism town planning and so on that we that we ought to be addressing and teaching um that, that i think would make the uh, that, that, that you know we, that would when we turn out you know students call it you know uh, 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 undergraduates in in in, in, in into the world that you know they'd be better equipped to, to cope with it and and would start to make the world a better place which is you know fundamentally what what why we do this job don't we we all you know we all believe that that's what why we're here you know i mean that's that's why most most architects are such lovely people because they want they want to make the world a better place they do they do and that's why we do it so uh i, I think it is time and it's just time for a rethink of how we how we teach and what we teach, don't you think? I 100% agree with you. John, that was lovely. Thank you very much. Oh, good. Thank you. And thanks very much. I enjoyed the conversation. Very I good. really enjoyed it. Gosh, that was good. Thanks again to John for his generous, insightful conversation. Please have a look in the podcast description for links to some of the material we spoke about. And don't forget to like, follow, subscribe and share Ears for Architecture far and wide. See you next year. Cheers. Cheers.